This was too much for Colonel Jordan's command. They were outflanked. The Confederates routed them from their barricade, and they surrendered shortly afterward. Dress it up, gentlemen. I'm the color. I suggest you go in and see if you will furnish some grain for the horses. Gentlemen, hold up there on the dock. Deploy some troops down there, sir. I am deployed. Oh, I am deployed. All right, sir. While Morgan's men sacked the stores in the town and levied heavy ransoms on the flour mills to prevent their burning, after burning the railroad bridges and looting the town, General Morgan obliged several of the local mill and factory owners to ransom their property, as in Corydon. One such excited property owner gave Morgan $1,200, but Morgan gave him $200 in change, stating that he didn't want to cheat anyone. The going rate was $1,000 per mill or factory. The raiders had such a good time looting Salem that they actually did some legitimate horse trading with a couple of local traders and got the worst of the bargain. Attempting to delay Union General Edward H. Hobson's troops, the Confederates wasted or used up all the extra food along the way so the Yankees would have to hunt hard to find something to eat. Most of Morgan's men were actually little more than boys, not yet out of their teens. This perhaps explains their propensity for looting objects utterly useless for troops on the march. The favorite being whole bolts of calico for their sweethearts, wives, or mothers at home in Dixie, as such items were unavailable there. One such exuberant youth had a birdcage with live canaries tied to his saddle. The raiders' fun was coming to an end. They were able to destroy more property and cause more mischief in Indiana than anywhere else because they had more time. From now on, however, it would become a desperate race for Morgan and his men to reach safety or for the pursuing Union forces to entrap and capture him. Morgan reached the Ohio State Line at Harrison, Ohio, on Monday, July 13, 1863. With the knowledge that Burnside and Judah had concentrated forces in and around Cincinnati, Morgan felt that if he could get clear of this obstruction, he just might be able to escape. He split his force, making feints in several directions, most notably toward Hamilton, hoping to disperse Union forces so that he and his men could slip through to safety. Morgan and his men slipped around Cincinnati at night. He and his men spent 35 continuous hours in the saddle and covered more than 90 miles. Feeling comparatively safe at Williamsburg, Morgan allowed his men to camp and sleep. Hobson's cavalrymen had no difficulty in following Morgan's raiders with destroyed bridges for trail markers. He and his men would dry out between river crossings only to get another soaking at the next crossing. As the Yankees' energy waned, their hatred increased. It has been said that very few uncomplimentary names listed in the dictionary of English slang were not used to describe Morgan's men by Hobson's saddle-sore, hungry, waterlogged men. Most of the food they found available in their pursuit was not very good. Morgan's men had already eaten everything in sight. Hobson's discomfort was to be Morgan's undoing. Because the summer of 1863 was such a wet one, the Ohio River was navigable much further up the stream than usual, allowing Union gunboats to block Morgan's escape routes. Morgan turned north to Washington Courthouse, 60 miles to the north of the river, once again confounding his pursuers. 
In Piketon, Ohio, Morgan's Raiders did severe damage, ate well, and picked up some souvenirs. Some of the local folks critical of their behavior received a volley for their hasty remarks. Morgan continued into Pomeroy, where they skirmished with some home guards, then headed to Chester, where it seemed they got lost for what could have been the most critical 90 minutes of the raid. General Morgan was looking for a guide that might show him the fords at Buffington Island. The delay caused Morgan and his men to arrive after dark. Since the river crossing was defended by a small earthwork and about 300 men, Morgan decided to wait for daylight to cross into West Virginia. The following day was Sunday, and Morgan's previous good luck on Sundays had he and his men in great spirits. However, this time his luck had run out. While Morgan and his men camped at Portland, Ohio, the Federal commanders chasing Morgan prepared a trap. General Henry M. Judah, with about 4,000 troops, planned to block Morgan's crossing of the river. General James Shackelford had approximately 3,000 troops at Chester and planned to join Judah at the next morning. And two federal gunboats were adding to Morgan's woes at Portland. About 2 a.m., Morgan roused his men and ordered Basil Duke to attack the Union earthwork, which was found empty. At about 3 a.m., Judah's men attacked, emerging from the brush and tall weeds along the river. Basil Duke's men stopped the attack and counterattacked Judah's men, capturing General Judah's adjutant. As the raiders under Duke were reforming, the 3,000 troops under Shackleford arrived, forcing Duke and about 650 men to surrender. General Morgan managed to escape with about 1,200 men. At Reedsville, Ohio, Morgan tried to cross the Ohio again ordering Colonel Adam R. Stovepipe Johnson to attempt the crossing with between 300 and 400 men. Morgan was nearly across when he saw two Union gunboats approaching, and he turned back to rejoin his men trapped on the North Shore. Colonel Johnson and his men escaped. On the last day of the raid, July 26th, at West Grove Cemetery, at the junction of Jefferson, Columbiana, and Carroll Counties, Morgan's men fought their last skirmish. Two died. John Miller and an unknown, very young boy, laid to rest where they died, still there today. Morgan and his men continued north, turning east at the Bethesda Church, hoping to escape. However, it was all but over. Major George W. Rue recently arrived with 300 fresh troops, managed to cut off Morgan from the river again. Morgan tried to surrender to Captain Burbick of the local militia on the condition that his men should keep their sidearms and receive safe conduct out of the state. Burbick accepted Morgan's surrender on the stated conditions. Upon arriving, Major Rue demanded that Morgan surrender unconditionally to him or fight. Outnumbered, exhausted, and out of ammunition, Morgan had simply run out of options. The great raid was over with 439 men surrendering and only 200 men in the command fit for duty. Morgan surrendered to Major Rue on 26th July, 1863.